We request the audience to put your cell phones on silent mode and maintain the decorum inside the auditorium. Also, ensure that there will be no moving in or moving out of the auditorium during the session. <clears throat> William Osler said, and I quote, the value of experience is not in seeing much, but in seeing wisely. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and esteemed participants, a warm welcome to the Global IRE Summit. Global Institute of Business Studies Bangalore, in collaboration with the Humanistic Management Network Switzerland, India chapter, is organizing this summit with a theme of responsible innovation and entrepreneurship. I, Sanjeeda Yasmin, am honored to stand before you as the host of this prestigious event alongside my co-host Arun. Today, we embark on a journey of insightful discussions and thought-provoking perspectives with an overarching theme of instilling and fostering beliefs in our endeavors. As we commence this summit, let us begin by acknowledging the light of knowledge. The lighting of the lamp symbolizes the enlightenment that this gathering brings and uniting us all in our pursuit of understanding and ethical leadership. We would like to call upon the esteemed guests and all the dignitaries to come forward for the lamp lighting. Thank you, dignitaries. We have with us Ms. Baishali Datta from PGDM first year to invoke the blessings of the divine. Sharanya, Tribhuvan Tanya, Suramuni Bandita Charana, Navarasa Madhura, Kavita Mukhara, 
Sharano Pranamama. Thank you. Thank you, Bhai Shali, for your beautiful rendition. Now, I would like to call upon Dr. Jayanta Chakraborty, our esteemed Dean and Principal, for the welcoming address. Dr. Jayanta has, to his credit, a B.Tech in Mechanical Engineering, M.A. in Economics, M.B.A. in Marketing and Finance, Ph.D. in Business Analytics and Digital Marketing. With over two decades in the steel, education and IT industries, his career is marked by strategic projects for top tier clients like Coca-Cola, SHRM and Colgate Pamelif among others. His professional journey extends across global cities like Switzerland to New Delhi, enhancing his cross-cultural expertise. His leadership at GIBS Business School has been instrumental in shaping future leaders. I would also like to invite Bharat Gopalan sir to present a bouquet. Hello. Uh, respected MD sir, uh, our distinguished delegates uh, from across the globe, uh, my fellow faculty members and my dear students, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, so when I was a student like you, my favorite uh, serial used to be Star Trek and I loved that punchline to boldly go where no human being has gone before. Uh, much later in life, I started admiring Elon Musk. He was making driverless car he was talking about putting a chip in the human brain and converting us into human arts. And I was very fascinated with that until I met Ritesh sir. And uh, he was talking about a different concept. Uh, he wants to give to the students what he did not get in life. Uh, he wants to spread the message of uh, humanness, uh, human kindness uh, uh, among everybody. And uh, he said, sir, I'm looking for people who have that uh, goodness inside the heart. And uh, we are very fortunate today that uh, we have uh, global ambassadors of uh, humanistic management uh, network, Dr. Ernst, Dr. Wolfgang, Dr. Anastasia, our very beloved uh, Dr. Shiv Tripathi sir. He is my mentor and guide also. <laughs> uh, we are very fortunate that in a very short notice they have agreed to come all the way to Bangalore and address all of you. Uh, today, if you look at the across the world, uh, we see a lot of violence. Uh, this uh, Israel Palestinians killing each other, Russians and Ukrainians killing each other, bomb blast in Iran and Pakistan and all that, and human beings uh, being converted into killing machines. So, what we need uh, in uh, today's context is to understand uh, how to become a good human being. And if you can become a good human being, uh, you can also make this world a great place to live in. Uh, that I promise you everybody who is attending here that that is the thing that you will get invaluable uh, uh, advice and uh, strategies and uh, discussions on how to become a good human being and that's very important in today's context. So thank you very much everyone for uh, coming here and uh, I welcome everybody to this uh, uh, seminar which will uh, I think will uh, lead to some great thoughts in days to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Following this, we are privileged to have Mr. Ritesh Goel, founder and managing director of GIBS Business School. He is a motivational speaker, business coach, and an author. He has delivered 500 plus talks to corporate employees, leaders, students, and entrepreneurs. He has been hosted by several top universities and many startup forums and corporates, such as BNI Champions Chapter the world's largest chapter of 120 highly successful entrepreneurs, Inspiration Unlimited, and many more. His visionary approach has played a pivotal role in the success and growth of our institution. We welcome you, sir.
uh, a very good morning to all of you. So I'm sure you guys must be seeing this diary whenever I come on the stage and I make a notes by sitting on the stage. You can see ISB, Indian School of Business. And trust me, uh, I really want to change it to IRE within maybe another three to five years span of time. So I'll be carrying IRE diary and I'm sure many of you will be carrying in the corporate world as well as uh, the entrepreneurs who are going to start their own journey. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is with great pride and humility that I stand before you today as the managing director of GIBS Business School, India's leading business school fostering innovation, design thinking and entrepreneurship. Welcome to the Global IRE Summit 2024 an event that marks a significant milestone in our collective journey towards shaping the future of business, innovation, and leadership. Today, we are joined by an esteemed assembly of thinkers, leaders, and innovators, including Dr. Ernst Vaughan, Dr. Wolfgang, Dr. Shiv K. Tripathi, and Dr. Anastasia. Your presence enriches our summit and underscores the global collaboration essential for driving forward the agenda of innovation and entrepreneurship. At GIBS, we have always believed in the transformation and transformative power of education. Our mission is to empower our students with not just knowledge, but with the wisdom to apply this knowledge creatively and ethically in the business world. The spirit of IRE, Innovation Research and Entrepreneurship, is the cornerstone of our philosophy, guiding us to foster an environment where ideas can flourish and visions can be transformed into reality. So now I'll take you through the journey of, G uh, journey of GIB IRE school, our journey through the establishment of the IRE school to the expansive initiative under IRE development has been remarkable. We have ventured beyond the traditional boundaries of education, incorporating real-world education, business plan development from ideation to prototyping and hosting large-scale IRE conferences across India, major cities like Delhi, Bangalore, Calcutta, engaging over 1,000 institutions in a dialogue on innovation. Within two and a half years, IRE was started with only three trainers in 2020 with a simple classroom teaching and where we have delivered about 300 plus hours of program with 18 credits with and today we have started about 30 plus ventures under IRE. The IRE talks have emerged as a pivotal uh, platform for sharing ideas featuring over 600 discussions with influential figures from Shark Tank India, TEDx and Joe's Talks. This initiative, along with the issuance of more than 55,000 IRE certificates, reflects our commitment to nurturing the next generation of leaders and thinkers. Our dedication extends beyond traditional educational formats and demonstrated by our IRE awards, entrepreneur interviews, the establishment of IRE production house, and the launch of IRE podcasts and master classes. These initiatives are a testament to our commitment to excellence and our vision to onboard more than 10 experts by July 2024 as we embrace the H2H, human to human, and it was a coincidence that BG sir has yesterday shared me, you know, the concept of H2H by Humanistic Management Network. So I personally believe in H2H. Uh, we are in the world of technology, we are in the uh, world of machines, but I'm sure H2H will prevail forever. And this is something which I, because for me, HR is not a human resource department, it is a human relations department. I always feel human is not a, uh, not a resource. This is the resource, paper is the resource, but human is not a resource. We can develop the relationship with the human and we can create n number of machines and the technologies by the human. 
this, philo this philosophy is not just about education, it's about building a community of leaders who are prepared to face the challenges of tomorrow with integrity, creativity and compassion. As we kick off the Global IRE Summit 2024, let us engage in meaningful conversations, force new partnerships and inspire each other towards greater heights of innovation and entrepreneurship. I am deeply grateful for your presence and participation in this journey. Together, let's embark on this exciting path towards creating a more innovative, sustainable and entrepreneurial world. The last line, IRE is not a program in GIBS. IRE is an emotion. It is a feeling and I always say feelings equals to dealings. So thank you so much and welcome to the Global IRE Summit 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Ritesh, sir, for highlighting the transformational and inspiring journey of IRE. Now I would like to invite Dr. Jayanta, sir, to present him with a bouquet. We welcome our first keynote speaker, Dr. Shiv Tripathi, Vice Chancellor, Athmiya University, Rajkot, and India Chapter Lead for the Humanistic Management Network. He was also the Dean of Faculty at Berlin School of Business and Innovation. He has over 25 years of experience in teaching research and education management. In addition to his full-time experience in different roles as educator and academic leader, he has been a visiting faculty to several renowned universities across the globe. Being a founder of a startup in Estonia, his corporate experience includes advisory and board membership roles in different companies in India, South Africa and Tanzania. His commitment to humanistic values and management is truly commendable. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. A very good morning to all of you. Founder and promoter of this is wonderful business school, Riteshi, uh, distinguished panelists and guests, Dr. Wolfgang, Dr. Ernst, Anastasia, Dr. Chakravarti, faculty colleagues, and dear students. First, I am grateful to Gibbs family for giving this opportunity to share some of the reflection on the theme of responsible innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, when we enter in a business school with all aspirations, all dreams and with some picture or vision of after two years what we are going to do, I am just addressing to all the students, all of you will be having this. And as we make the progress, we, our dreams keep changing. And when we complete the program and we end up with some job or placement and we enter the corporate world, then most of the global survey says that there are two common findings across the world. One is what we learned in a business school was not that relevant what we are practicing today. It's most of the alumni, recent alumni, they say. Second is, I could have done something differently so I could have been at a different place. My friends, why it ha happens? Reason is the methodology. The worldwide 120 years before when the first formal MBA program was introduced by the Harvard and then since then, wherever we are offering the business education, there is a copy-paste model going on. Although we want to be innovative, but if you'll see, uh, I guarantee you, if you compare the program structure and course nomenclature across the world, you will find the same course uh, coming in with the some name or the different name in the first semester, second semester, trimester, whatever structure you have. 
Why have we not been able to innovate? Even today, if you look into many of the business schools, they are in the race of teaching digital marketing, AI, just looking into some of the competency report, job market report, and saying that for every manager, we need to learn AI, we need to learn technology. Students also say, when I survey some of the students, when I interact with most of the students, they say, we want to learn AI, because without AI, we can't do anything, or new technologies, digital marketing. Just think over, if you go through your, for example, I'm just giving one example, if you are studying marketing, technology is just one mode or a tool. If you understand marketing very well, you can, you can apply technology very well. So we, you should not be focusing on this, some of the things which are emerging in order to be relevant for what you are preparing for. And there the, comes the role of human to human. I am so happy to be here that this business school is connecting human to human and I would add another element, human to human for human. Because if we do this, that is the only way when the prosperity can be sustainable. We can be successful for years, we can be successful for decades, but trust me, we can't be successful for centuries or forever if we are not following the formula of human to human for human. And to do this, you have to engage yourself in learning which is not packed in a computer or packed in a book or packed in a classroom. You have to be free thinker. You have to innovate your learning. You have to see how you can engage with what is happening around you. And in that way, you can be more relevant, you can be more confident, and you can be more human for the human. I would not be taking much of the time as we have a panel to follow. Thank you so much and we will be interacting. Thank you, sir, for your insightful words on human to human for human. We are honored to have Dr. Ernst von Kimakowis co-founder of the Humanistic Management Network at the University of Lucerne, Switzerland, as the second keynote speaker for the day. The Humanistic Management Network is a global network registered as a Swiss association that lives, works, and acts through local chapters and collaborations in many countries around the globe. Having a purpose to encourage, promote and support economic activities and business conduct that demonstrate unconditional respect for the dignity of life, Dr. Kimakowa's global perspective on humanistic management will be an invaluable contribution to our summit. We welcome you, sir. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, <coughs> and thank you so much for this invitation. I've been at GIBS for under an hour, and I feel at home already. It is a wonderful institution by what I've seen so far. The few interactions we had uh, tell me that the Humanistic Management Network has a place uh, where we can interact, where we are aligned uh, on our fundamental ideas, and on why we think think businesses should exist and what businesses should be doing, and by that also how we look at entrepreneurship and innovation. Let me start with addressing the students primarily, that uh, you know you are in a situation different to, to my generation, where you're likely to grow old in a world that is substantially different from today. We are having some geostrategic shifts and changes that will be very impactful on all of us and that you will be able to find opportunities in, but challenges as well that are within there. Now, what does that mean for entrepreneurship and innovation? I think if we're looking at the overall context, then we need to see that maintaining peace will be 
an increasing task for us and business can play a role therein. By working towards more equitable societies, by working towards stabilizing and strengthening democratic institutions, businesses can and have a role to play uh, for addressing the big challenge we have of maintaining peace as we move back into a bipolar world. Another challenge we're having is, of course, the, um, uh, the environmental challenge. And there we need to be very clear that either businesses will innovate and entrepreneurs will start businesses with a mindset of making a positive contribution uh, to solving and to finding solutions for the environmental challenges we're facing. It is not a question of whether we want to do that, it is a, it is a question of whether uh, we will survive as a species, as humanity or not. I'm sure we will, I'm sure we will get our act together, but businesses and entrepreneurs and the innovations they bring about have a role to play here. Because either Nature, nature is stronger than us, that, that is for sure. And so we need to learn to live within our means. That is a task where businesses have a vital role to play by looking at what do our innovations produce, what is the results, what are the impacts of our innovations, and if they don't have, make a positive environmental impact, uh, that business is unlikely to have a chance of, of succeeding uh, going forward because it's simply a necessity. And another third big challenge I want to highlight is the challenge of distribution. Um, especially here in India, I greatly admire the uh, 2047 development agenda. But you will not be able to reach that goal and you will only be able to succeed in reaching that goal if you're doing it in a more equitable way. Growth in itself is meaningless if you don't look at distribution as well. Growth alone does not tell us anything about how individuals in the society can thrive, what opportunities they have, and how they can participate in the societies around them. So we need to look not only at producing growth, but we need to look also at how are we distributing. And with that, we need to move towards a more equitable society and for achieving sustainably the development goals that are written down, are outlined in the 2047 agenda, you will need to look at creating equitable development and creating inclusive development. And business has a great role to play there. Businesses are the primary agents of uh, innovation, are the primary agents of uh, uh, producing all goods and services that we need and that we like and that we have. So there is a great link between the three words we're seeing here, responsible innovation and entrepreneurship. And I think that uh, going forward, we have to, we need to focus strongly on the responsibility part. And the good news is that I have absolutely no doubt with students that I meet around the world that you are driven to do that. That no longer students want only to have a good income and a comfortable life, but you want to make an impact. All over the world I go, I find student communities that are engaged, that say, yes, we want a career, yes, we want to be successful, but we want to do it with a positive impact. And maintain that spirit, that is the one big request I have for all of you, maintain that spirit throughout your career. Stay young at heart and continue wanting to make impact and then uh, our future is bright and you will you will clean up the mess my generation has produced and we will have a more equitable a more fair and an environmentally healthier planet going forward so that humanity as one family can thrive thank you very much thank you sir may i please request you to stay on the stage i would also like mr uh, dr shiv tripathi to join us on the stage please Now I would request uh, our uh, Ritesh Gul sir to join us on the stage and present them with a bouquet.
I would like to extend a warm welcome to our next keynote speaker, Dr. Wolfgang Aman, Professor of Strategy and Leadership at HEC Paris. He has, to his credit, several awards such as the Best Paper Award at ICA SSA Conference 2017 for the article on achieving sustainable strategic advantage through inclusive business. Outstanding Reviewer Award 2020 from the European Academy of Management, recognition of outstanding leadership and service from the Academy of Management, and many more. His expertise in management education will add a rich layer to our discussions today. We welcome you, sir. Good morning, and a big thank you for the privilege and pleasure of being here. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Indeed, I've been in uh, education, management education for 25 years, trying to do new things, new ways of learning, shifting the focus to practical wisdom because knowledge is out there, freely available on YouTube and uh, other means. Uh, so trying to do new things, which is why it's a pleasure to be here and exchange good thoughts over the next uh, uh, hours that we have uh, together. Um, in management education, uh, I don't think we are there yet. Uh, we still have a number of challenges to, to overcome, and uh, they can be at the global level, at the environmental level, social level, but even now within our workplaces, uh, we need to be better prepared for what is ahead um, and, and position ourselves, yourselves, even more uh, effectively. Uh, management Google Denning said, without facts, you're just another person with an opinion. So I always look for some facts first. And globally, there are these surveys, you know, did you feel stress a lot yesterday? 40% say yes. Did you feel anger, uh, notably, uh, this week? or last week, and people say yes, a third. Um, 70, 80 percent don't really care what's happening to the workplaces as long as they get their paycheck. Uh, 10, 20, at times even more, of staff members are actively disengaged. Maybe a little sabotaging, knowing intentionally to, um, that they have submitted their reports too late. So, so we're not there yet um, in order to create better, more humanistic uh, workplaces that allow us to thrive. And through the means of education, uh, hopefully, we can create better uh, workplaces. And, and I think the future will also uh, challenge us more, which is why I don't think uh, it's just nice to know certain skills. We should really get to know us as much as possible. And this is not a, a simple task. Let me just invite you to a small uh, brain experiment. All of you probably know the Rubik's Cube. Right, it has five colors, three times three dimensions, uh, 43 quintillion uh, positions if you really finish the turn. Um, managing humans is a little bit more complex. Uh, if you look into different models, like Bergman, he has nine dimensions uh, and many more uh, colors to add. So, so it's not just 43 quintillion, that's 43 plus uh, 18 zeros, it's many more zeros. And how on earth are we dealing with that uh, complexity? So, so in that sense, uh, humans are the most complex things on the planet, um, which is why we really need to develop this empathy to understand how important humans are, how they tick, and what we can do. And I'm sure over the course of our panel, we have some ideas to discuss uh, how to make good, uh, good progress. So in that sense, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to interesting discussions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We would request you to be present on the stage. I would like to call upon Mr. Mohan Raj, Dean of Placements, JIBS Business School, to present him with a bouquet.
welcome the last keynote speaker for the day, Dr. Anastasia Kuritsi, who is a sustainability researcher and university faculty from Germany and the UK. She is a multidisciplinary influential professional with a wealth of experience across the shipping industry as well as international relations, energy economics and EU sociology as well as marketing and tourism, who enjoys challenges and problem solving with energy and commitment. She has acquired 10 plus years of work experience in different countries such as Greece, UK, France, Qatar, Dubai, and Germany. Her insights into sustainable practices will undoubtedly enrich our understanding of creating value with values. We welcome you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure being here with you in this happy place. <laughs> I saw it uh, written uh, in the wall as well. I see it in your smiles. Uh, and uh, this is exactly what I would like to state here. How important it is to feel part of a community that embraces you and motivates you uh, in such a way to bring the best out of you. And when is it that we feel the most creative? It is exactly when we feel happy and the sense of belonging. This is exactly why the, success company, the successful companies, uh, they value their employees equally as much, if not more, than their actual customers. Uh, what was said also before uh, today, uh, and as we all experience. We have these multiple changes in this world with all these um, uh, disruptions uh, in our society, uh, in our social life, with all this um, uh, digital, social media and all that. Uh, AI, we are tired of uh, <laughs> uh, listening, AI here, AI there. Uh, sustainability challenges, uh, how we address all this um, uh, uh, problems, it's not a nice word to use, but yes, there are problems there. Uh, and how we address this in a very um, um, impactful way so that uh, we can find a place to position ourselves. This is why we're all here. Uh, this is why we invest time and money um, and energy to, to, to develop further. And uh, to develop further in a changing world. So change is the key. It has always been the key. Uh, change is something that it will happen, unavoidably. It, it does happen uh, uh, from a bio, biological perspective. It does happen. Uh, we see all these changes um, uh, in politics uh, as well, that uh, uh, it creates this domino effect with inflation and then the job uh, uh, market and the way we do business. Uh, and of course, this affects also the entrepreneurship. So, uh, change, how we embrace change uh, and uh, develop resilience. Uh, there are ways, uh, stress we cannot avoid, uh, but there are also optimum levels of stress. Uh, and uh, this is why we are here, to give you stimulus. Uh, educational systems are not, of course, the only micro world that you get stimulus. Uh, we have multiple sources, uh, family, uh, 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 friendly circles, and so on, uh, different cultural backgrounds. But one thing that it is that we have in common, that we all want to exchange knowledge, to exchange best practices uh, for a person first of all, and then business development. Because what we have uh, and what we have uh, inherited from our ancestors is uh, um, w ways to, to, to be resilient, ways to this wisdom, this common wisdom, ways to, to, to be good, actually. To be good to ourselves, first of all, uh, because if you have not uh, received 
uh, uh, positive vibes, positive um, um, uh, stimulus, it is not something that you know. So if you don't know something, you cannot give it. Uh, and um, finally, I would like to uh, finish up with uh, change that uh, has to do with our uh, identity change. We all are born and nobody knows uh, what we are going to do. Uh, we are exploring ourselves, so we uh, uh, mentioned earlier uh, the challenge to stay relevant, uh, to find a way to engage with uh, wherever we uh, move, uh, and uh, unfortunately we need to do it in a way that it's also profitable. Uh, because we need to uh, uh, make uh, ends meet um, and provide for ourselves, families and the uh, uh, broader society that we are a uh, member of. So, how uh, we discover ourselves, it was mentioned earlier, it was mentioned also from the ancient philosophers in different cultures as well, uh, but I will just mention one that was uh, uh, from Greece, that is my home country, and it was uh, 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 the, the, the famous saying, the most important thing in life is to know oneself. And this is, it sounds easy, but it's not. We have multiple layers, and every circumstance, every context, context uh, pr um, releases another layer that we may or may not have. So the change of identity, um, it's something that uh, we all want. Uh, somebody wants to have uh, a better status, somebody wants to have more money, somebody wants to have a, a, a better uh, a friend circle, a better wife, a better husband, this and that, a better car, whatever. But uh, at the end of the day, we need to ask ourselves why we want this or that. Because if we have clarity there, then it is very, very... Uh, uh, easy, much more easy, to avoid distractions, that we have plenty of distractions, uh, and we will have more, uh, to avoid distractions and to uh, uh, make the proper efficient strategies to know the how. So, know the whys uh, and then uh, understand how these patterns function, what it doesn't function, we recognize it, to be aware it is uh, very, very uh, difficult. Once we are aware, then uh, we understand the whys and we start implementing the hows. Uh, and finally, to, to, to close uh, and to continue with our panel discussion, I would like to say that um, uh, as uh, Newton, uh, the famous uh, physician, uh, 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 scientist from physics once said, uh, I would have not reached for anywhere, I would not reach anything if I would not be able to stand on the shoulders of others. Uh, and by this, he means what collective knowledge we have inherited from all these enlightened personalities across the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. We would request you to kindly stay back on the stage. I request Professor Hari Prakash Karchella to come and present her with a book. on the theme Responsible Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I also extend a hearty welcome to our panelists, Dr. Ernst, Dr. Shiv Tripathi, Professor Bharat Gopalan, Dr. Wolfgang, Dr. Anastasia. 
So before we start our panel discussion, let me just quickly set the tone for today's uh, discussion. Now, as we all know that we keep hearing organizations focusing on profits above everything else, right? Every organization is only in the race towards profitability. And somewhere in the midst of it, we forget talking about humans. Though we've talked about the evolution and the studies about humans, but somewhere in the race, we're forgetting our focus on human. But then the humanistic perspective, which we've been, which is the center of our discussion today, it's some way or the other, it brings back the humans into the picture, wherein they focus on not just individuals, but also creating good communities and the planet at large as well. And while we keep hearing discussions around technology everywhere, we are very fortunate that today in this panel discussion, we would be focusing on humans. So without any further delay, let us start and begin our panel discussion. So I would be asking different questions to our panelists here. Once the panel discussion gets over, the floor will be open to question and answers from the audience. So with the permission of all of you, I think we may start the panel discussion. So my first question is to you, Dr. Ernst. And the very obvious question, which I'm sure everybody wants to hear an answer to. What is the basic philosophy behind the Humanistic Management Network? Thank, thank you very much. Um, of course, that is a question people want to know and we do get asked. And uh, we define humanistic management through three main steps. And the first is the, the foundational and most important one is the respect for the dignity of life. We truly believe in the humanistic management network, in the things we do, the research we produce, the events we have, the people we interact with, the collaborations we seek, uh, that these can only be productive and we can only um, achieve what we want to achieve if we genuinely and deeply demonstrate and carry in us respect for the dignity of life. Um, now there's two things here. It's a bit of a double-edged sword because I have not met any executive yet who has told me dignity is nonsense. We don't need this. What are you talking about? So that's the good side. The part where we have to work on little, little is how do we operationalize that? How do we support business organizations, executives, uh, startups, uh, anyone who is engaged, involved in economic activity to not only agree that dignity is tremendously important, but to provide support to organizations to demonstrate and live and act in a way that uh, respect for the dignity of life is warranted. Second and third, I just mentioned and keep it shorter. Um, a second uh, part is the integration of ethics in uh, managerial decision making. So what we find quite often is what in business ethics we call a corrective logic, where businesses are run and operated with a primary focus on uh, profitability. And then something goes wrong and then you have to spend a lot of money, time, effort to fix it. And we would say in humanistic management, integrate ethical reflection into your decisions and you will build things in a way that they last longer and they don't break so easily, your impact will be more positive and over a longer period of time it will be economically beneficial also. And third, we say, as the third step of humanistic management, active and ongoing engagement with your stakeholders. Mistakes happen, honest mistakes happen, questions pop up that you don't have an answer to, talk to those people who are affected by you as a business organization. Have an ongoing, organized, active exchange with civil society actors, with your employees, with your investors, with your customers. Learn from and with each other uh, what societal needs are and how businesses can positively contribute to fulfilling those. And you know the good news is this will be good for business. So that's how we define humanistic management. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ernst. So I think he very rightly mentioned that when we are talking about humanistic uh, management here, how can we forget uh, you know, integrating ethics into whatever we do? And I think it rightly makes a lot of sense that we don't need to just practice and keep talking about you know, our profitability only, but then talk about how can we bring all our stakeholders together. So thank you so much uh, on this viewpoint. So uh, Dr. Wolfgang, uh, Dr. Ernst just said that it's important that we integrate everybody here. So when I talk about humanistic management, how do you think it creates a positive impact on the businesses? And if you're saying that, okay, business is there, is business at the receiving end of it? Or is business involved in this whole process? So wh what is your take on that? 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, I think that businesses need to differentiate between what should be the case and what is the case. And I think at the moment we are still too much of dehumanizing uh, at, at work and that can and, and must change. And when we talk about management and when we talk about uh, humans, then I think we really need to understand what is it that humans want to do. So we need to really focus on the human. And I think humans, the human psyche wants to accomplish two things in life, growth and healing. And while growth is obvious uh, through education, for higher career levels, we often seem to forget uh, the second part. Uh, we enter this world getting a clear message. The world out there is powerful, you are not. The world out there can do things you can't when you're young. And it's a decades long journey to compensate for that, to catch up, to please the environment. I do believe that in the first half of life we are doing nothing else but to please the expectations of our environments. And then in midlife uh, this changes when we notice time is running out. So in that sense, workplaces should offer opportunities for both. Growth, where does our potential lead us, our role models, our excitements, our curiosity but also that we have at work the opportunity uh, with good leaders, with good colleagues to work on what is still missing and where we want to go. We, we all feel, maybe to different degrees, our shoes are two sizes too small. We all feel we can do more. So let us have workplaces where we get our individuality respected, where we can be us, where we can become even more of us, and in that sense, businesses, organizations are transmission spells. They are places where we should really emphasize opportunities to grow and to heal. And I'm not the only one proclaiming that. Uh, Nicolas Ciani last year won globally the best book award for his book on the leader as healer. So there's more than just to maximize performance and the returns we get for an HR. Um, we need to really understand humans and care for them and enable them uh, to become what they're destined. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wolfgang. So yeah, while you say that uh, when we talk about humanistic management, it is important that leaders understand and give opportunities to their employees for growth, but at the same time also take care of the healing because in that entire process we believe that humans are constantly under pressure, under stress, so I think that environment of healing also needs to be provided. And that uh, brings me to another question which I have for you, uh, Dr. Shiv. So basically in this humanistic perspective we are talking about you know, values and uh, humans. So do you think it is aligned with our own Indian ethos as well, our own value system which talks about people, it talks about value system, it talks about ethics. So do you feel that it is somewhere or the other aligned with our own Indian ethos and Indian beliefs as well? Uh, thank you for this question and this is a very interesting question when we discuss about the comparative ethos and comparative values. You know, there is a term if you we have been discussing for last five, six years in India, particularly in technical education also and management education, universal human values. And when we say universal human values, it's beyond any country, beyond any reason, we are looking for certain principles. So the humanistic management network, the values it is promoting, it is more focusing on universal human values, which fits anywhere. And for that matter, if you research, the uh, look into the values which are coming from the different traditions, cultural traditions, religious traditions, re regions, you won't find any difference. It is uh, the practitioners who have created the differentiation and boundaries. But the fundamentals remain same worldwide. Every human has same values, they are motivated by the same motivator. At some stage of the life it may differ from person to person, but these are very, very contextual issues. Fundamentally, they align it to one. And that's what the humanistic management network. So I would say 100% it's aligned to uh, Indian ethos and values, only it's the matter of what lens you are looking into and how you are looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiv. So yeah, like uh, Dr. Shiv mentioned that it's, it's not that these values are different from culture to culture. When we talk about these values, they definitely have a universal approach. 
Which then brings me to another question for you, uh, Dr. Anastasia. So in what way do you think the current education system, whether again it is in Germany or it is in US or in, it, is, it is in any other country, how do you think our education system can probably evolve? Like in the morning, Dr. Shiv mentioned that we are still teaching the same principles, same philosophies and nothing has changed. So how do you think we can bring about some changes in our education system and align it more with the humanistic perspective? So do you think there is something for us to learn there? Uh, I would like to address this question. First of all, uh, we only understand the present uh, by analyzing a bit, having a knowledge of the past uh, in order to have at least a vision for the, for the future. So how education, how it all started, uh, it had nothing to do with these uh, organized uh, systems that we now have, uh, that is massive education. Uh, and uh, actually now uh, we all know um, it is this fast education that uh, we have multiple subjects, but uh, very limited knowledge of each. Uh, because there is not enough time. You just give stimulus at the best, uh, uh, at the best, uh, 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 this is only what you can give, and each individual can take it and can dedicate extra time, focus where uh, he or she can accomplish more, has more skills, has more, um, you know, it's, it's more up to, to the individual to expand. Uh, in the old days, uh, education was uh, something more uh, like a, a mentor, it's, it was more like one-to-one. -one. And it was also kept uh, a bit uh, like, uh, like a sect. So only the very uh, rich and uh, powerful were able to afford such a private mentor. Uh, now what we see as, as in, the, in the duration of uh, uh, all these uh, multiple years that are species in the planet is that uh, when people are um, uh, aware that there are other ways to, 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 to live this human experience, um, they act better. We have uh, less uh, conflicts uh, and so on. We have uh, uh, more uh, potential uh, brainstorming ideas. Uh, we exchange knowledge uh, and nowadays, of course, with uh, AI, uh, we, we can exchange uh, in a very uh, rapid way. Because AI is not something bad, it's not something good, it's just a tool. Uh, and uh, we all know what uh, also uh, a Chinese proverb uh, says, there is no uh, bad or good tool. It is, uh, uh, no matter how good the tool is, it is uh, how we use it. If we use that tool uh, as uh, something uh, that is perceived as a bad cause, then the tool will, will work in a wrong way. If we use the tool, like diamond, right? Diamonds uh, are very sharp, actually, and very, uh, uh, they are used as weapons as well. Uh, but at the same time, they are used as jewels, right? It has to do how we use. Uh, and now with uh, artificial intelligence, all these uh, digital systems, of course, we can, what we have is big data accumulation that uh, we can easily share. And remember how it was during the pandemic. Uh, if we hadn't ha uh, have these uh, systems, uh, internet invention, uh, uh, computers, uh, Zoom and all that, digital pedagogies, we wouldn't have uh, had the opportunity to give uh, uh, people some meaning. Uh, a lot of people strived, for example, during that period, also with mental issues, uh, because we all want to feel involved and to have that sense of belonging. So, uh, as I said earlier, we need to see how it was in the past, how it is today, and uh, intelligence is just one aspect. Uh, to have vision and imagination is the other aspects, and the combination is the best. So, we need, as I said earlier, uh, to ask ourselves what we want. 
what we want and what we don't want. If it is something that we like in the current system, we keep it. If we see that there is a gap, what is the gap now? Usually it's said now that uh, it is uh, so massive, education, that uh, it doesn't correspond to the changing world and uh, the skills that are taught there are not the ones desired from uh, the employers. And it is partially true. Because uh, uh, in that uh, fast world that uh, we have, you, you study digital uh, 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 marketing or this or that uh, today, and uh, in few months we have a new application. That of course it's not the fault of the school that didn't teach this to you, but uh, it is this new thing and uh, all the time you are alert. You need to invest more time, more money, more stress, as I said earlier, and you need to find a way to cope with this. Unfortunately, this is the case now, and um, we all need to strive to find, uh, 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 to position ourselves, because uh, this, is, uh, um, this is what it is. We, we uh, dedicate time and energy, as I said earlier, and money, uh, to, to, to enhance and become better. Uh, uh, with our skills, with our understanding uh, capabilities and enhance our uh, intelligence and emotional intelligence. Because the successful leadership uh, is not about who speaks uh, uh, the most languages, who knows the most applications there, the updated ones. Uh, it is good to know, of course, to have the know-how, but the, 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 the most important thing is to cultivate empathy, to understand and to connect the dots and to recruit the, and to form teams that one will uh, uh, supplement the other. Because usually it's not one super genius who can do everything, right? So uh, these were my inputs to this question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anastasia. So like she very rightly said, uh, the education system, what it can do is to help you all understand that we need to integrate technology in whatever way we're learning. So that is how probably we need to evolve. And as Dr. Anastasia said, that leaders have a certain role right there as well. Which brings me to another question to Professor Bharat here. So uh, Professor Bharat, could you please tell us how does GIBS leadership ensure or how does it bring humanistic perspective in the way it conducts itself and in the way it treats its people? Uh, thank you, Dr. Pallavi, for the question that we can contextualize what we have been talking about in the context of GIBS. Before that, thank you all panelists for, the, for sharing your interesting thoughts on humanistic values. Uh, when I talk of GIBS, I think right from morning we have been one core philosophy or theme that has been running all through is humanistic values. Morning when we were having a small chat in the board room, we were talking about H to H. That has been a very core philosophy that our leadership holds close to the heart. And today this is happening because we have that H to H philosophy at the core of it. Why I say that is, think of a week back, we are just Dr. Jayanta sir was mooting this idea of having this IRU Global Summit. And uh, I was wondering, being in the thick of operational issues, can it happen within a week? A global uh, luminaries and uh, luminaries and thought leaders coming together and sharing their thoughts. And it is happening today because our leadership believes that being focused to the larger purpose, at the same time being open to innovative ideas and newer ways of doing, brings new, new ways of, uh, new ways into our collective work. And having said that, I would say, beyond going beyond H to H, if you see the priorities that we hold, strategic priorities that we hold as an institution, if you walk into the room of uh, cabin of uh, managing director British, you find four P's. The rest are okay. Process-oriented approach, uh, progress, progressive thinking, and also public relations. But on the top of all these pieces, not HR, people. People orientation is something that we give utmost importance. But as you said, how do you operationalize it? How do you demonstrate it? I can give you a number of examples. For a short of time, I'll say only two things. How we engage, engaging people, which is a, becoming a big challenge, as uh, Dr. Wolfgang Yang mentioned. Uh, two ways. I'll talk about the exit and entry of our, our people in the organization. Entry. We don't consider it's our uh, 
unilateral right to choose people, but we give them an opportunity to experience our culture for a day or two, and they take a call. Rather than, because having worked in HR for decades, selecting people, I always thought it is our priority or prerogative to select the people. We don't do it here. People come in, experience the culture, and take a call, and we respect their decision whether to stay or leave. This is one, and the exit incorporates the moment people exit, they are treated as, yes, you know all that. But the thing is here, the exit month is the most cherishable month for any employee who walks in. They are given utmost respect, not stressed with work and all that. They can do their work, be happy in the organization. We all connect with them and make them feel good with the organization. These are two examples I can go on and on, but uh, probably for the paucity of time I should say. Pudding is in eating, so experiencing our culture could be one thing probably you would come to see in the coming days. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Bharat, for uh, sharing your thoughts. And I would resonate the same feelings that the very first day when you are having an interaction with our MD here, he says that, okay, I would not interview you, you interview us. And you find out what are the things because of which you would like to be at this place. And it's never a job interview that you might have faced anywhere else. So I would definitely say that we have practice and we have a lot of edge to edge approach here at GIBS Bangalore. So this, uh, with this, I come to my next question to you, uh, Dr. Ernst. So while we say that uh, the humanistic perspective in psychology that we talk about, it focuses on self-actualization, it focuses on an individual's values and individual at the center of everything. But then now with so much of talks about technology that we keep hearing about and so much of talk about AI being so important and now we know that Elon Musk is placing chips in human brains. So don't you think we are somewhere deviating from the humans here? Are we not moving away from the humanistic perspective here? What is your thought on this? Um, my thought is that we're at risk of moving away from it. It's, uh, it's not decided yet, uh, but it will take uh, active efforts to keep it at bay and to ensure that uh, technology will continue to serve humanity at large rather than turning into a mechanism that serves only very few people whilst it has a negative or adverse effect uh, on, on many, many people. And I think there we have some uh, work to do and I think uh, it is very challenging and one of the main challenges is I believe what I always call the asymmetry in speed uh, when we're looking at the time it takes for societal deliberation the time it takes us to decide if we want something or don't want something as a household, as a community, and certainly as a nation state or a global community, these processes are slow. Until we build consensus on, on something at a, at a national level, it takes forever. And on a global level, we are almost in are unable to ever succeed. Um, at the same time, we see that technologies are, are moving uh, you know, by the day. Uh, and which leads us into the situation currently that what is doable will be done because there's not really a democratic mechanism that can regulate and that can say, um, we know you can do this, but we don't want it. And, and so I think that is one of the major challenges we're having uh, to somehow uh, find mechanisms in which the speed that we take the time we need uh, to decide whether we want technologies uh, applied in specific ways or not um, is catching up with the speed at which these technologies emerge. But, but overall, so just to add this, o overall, uh, of course, technologies are tremendously beneficial to humanity or can be tremendously beneficial to humanity. But we need to uh, be a little cautious with the Silicon Valley narrative and maybe to some degree also the Bangalore narrative that technologies per se and automatically are producing desired results. They do not per se and do not automatically produce desired results. Humans need to make sure that those technologies uh, deliver the results that, that we want. Yeah, agree with you, uh, Dr. Ernst, that though we keep talking about technology, but still at the technology, the the, at the heart of it is humans. So again, we can say the same thing, that we are not really moving away from humans, but humans are at the center of it. 
So which brings me to the another question uh, for you, uh, Dr. Wolfgang. Could you please tell me how, uh, how is leadership involved in this entire uh, humanistic perspective? What role does leadership has here? Though we've been talking about you know, uh, organizations changing and leaders becoming important, but then what role exactly does leadership play here? Thank you, Dr. Pallavi, for the question. And I think it's absolutely crucial to understand the role of leadership development uh, for the larger, newer paradigm of humanistic management. Uh, just to, to be clear to everyone, we want to establish humanistic management as a competing, better paradigm to what is in place that businesses, organizations, uh, serve the purpose of human dignity in society as a good transmission belt. And for that, leadership development is as essential as it gets because leaders work on the system, managers work in the system. That means leaders are more important than managers. Managers may bring the machine uh, forward from day to day, but, but uh, leaders work on the system. And, and once more, I, I like to throw around numbers, uh, apologies for that. 70% um, of an individual's performance at work has nothing to do whether the Arcadian cycles are, are aligned, if uh, there is an education in place. 70% of somebody's performance is determined by the leader with all the good things and with the bad things. So in that sense, the leaders play a crucial role. 66% of people around the world say, the worst part of my life is my boss. 66%. So if you're talking about thriving, if you talk about respect for human dignity, well-being, um, we have a problem. It's not a discussion about moving good to great. It's about normalizing. It's about humanizing in the first place and then go on. And uh, just to throw one more number out there, I'm not sure what is uh, up in the city of Baltimore, but in the city of Baltimore, 21% of white collars working in offices have already actively thought about killing their boss. It has reached that level of, uh, of, of negative emotions, disappointment, um, disengagement um, that we need to work on. So in that sense, helping leaders fulfill the roles and responsibilities is absolutely essential. At the same point in time, it's also great fun to work in an industry, in a field where we can hopefully make a difference. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wolfgang, for your perspective. And uh, I think that way is, we've kind of been pretty lucky to be around amazing leaders. For myself, at least personally, I would say that uh, the way I have become a better individual, I think it is a lot because of my you know, leaders who were at the organizations that I have served. Uh, so, moving on to the next question that I have uh, for you, uh, Dr. Shiv. Uh, how did you find an alignment with the humanistic network, which is currently present across uh, the entire globe? So, how did you find that alignment with the humanistic network? How did that uh, you know, work for you? Uh, I'll take the example of two sectors. One is education, another is industry corporates. Uh, we all have been talking about sustainability, we all have been talking about corporate social responsibility, being responsible towards the society, adding value. I, it reminds me of a 70s classical article by Milton Friedman, who is criticized by CSR scholars, who said that business of business is business. And if you look into the Peter Drucker, what the fundamental purpose of business is, if businesses are legitimately doing the business, being transparent, fairly paying the taxes, and governments are fairly utilizing transparently the taxes collected from the businesses, we all are serving to humanity. Why we are discussing it today? Because we found there are deviations. And if you look at the root cause of this, transparency is at the core. So, so we, when we discuss about the humanistic concern, it is to reinforce the values for which the businesses should exist. And the, the, there is perfect alignment. 
we are not saying from something from the new planet we are not saying that humanistic management paradigm is something which will make you in a take you to a different zone and you start doing a different no just do what you are supposed to do in order to do that perfectly you need to be humanistic and that's what humanistic management is advocating for the same applies to the education when we all are in the education sector and you see the way we are educating our students thankfully after 2020 the new national education policy in india that is giving a lot of scope to the institutions to innovate where we can align to the framework global frameworks to the standard framework which will make us more humanistic and if you look into the human values is one of the priority area in the new national education policy so it aligns very well it fits very well and i am so hopeful that it has got potential to transform and it will help in transforming thank you thank you dr shiv for uh, sharing your perspective on how the corporates as well as education system is already having humans at the heart of whatever we do. Uh, so moving on to the next question uh, for you, Dr. Anastasia. Uh, so uh, we here at GIBS, in fact, you must have heard our MD talk about it and our Dean talk about it, that we here emphasize on innovation, research and entrepreneurship through our IRE workshops that we do every week. So it's a part of our curriculum that we do and we are very proud to say that it is something which is one of a kind and we don't see any institution practicing this uh, philosophy which we have here. So how do you think, uh, we've already talked about innovation, research and entrepreneurship, how do you think we can bring in the humanistic perspective into what we are already doing? Could you, could you share with us any insights which could be implemented into what we are already doing? Thank you for your question. I was uh, introduced to your uh, model yesterday and uh, I need to say that although in uh, all business schools uh, they do invite executives, they have uh, workshops and so on, uh, in no other school I have had uh, the chance to, uh, to hear that they do it in such an organized way and so frequently. Uh, this is the key word here that I want to mention, frequency. It is like going to the gym. If you are enrolled there and you go whenever you are in the mood, you don't achieve much, right? This is the analogy. Uh, if you go frequently, even if it is for a little, you are exposed just a little, but it is frequently, uh, consciously or subconsciously, you get the best results. So, uh, having said that, and um, uh, just uh, uh, bringing up again what was earlier discussed with regards to uh, these uh, challenges in the working environment, uh, we are doing all these workshops to see, to have the know-how, what employers want, right? Uh, so that we can adapt, this is the other key word, adaptability, uh, and see how we fit in there. What could we do? Um, sometimes it's not clear. It's not everybody managerial uh, material. Or maybe you are a good manager for this company, not good for the other company. And this is why um, my suggestion is uh, in order to explore yourself uh, and to see where you are comfortable, uh, to before you do any kind of entrepreneurship, uh, to be exposed, even if it is for a few days, uh, internship or whatever, uh, in different uh, companies that you like to have the know-how. Uh, because it's not simply the know-how of skills. It is, most importantly, the cultural know-how. It was mentioned uh, by Dr. Wolfgang earlier that uh, according to the reports, of course, uh, a, a, a tremendous stress is the culture. Many people, even if they have um, achieved, or for one reason or another, um, high position roles in this or that organization, no matter how prestigious this is, uh, they don't feel happy. Because to feel happy, we all are in pursuit of happiness, 
we need to feel nice. We need to feel nice. And uh, when we perform the best, when we don't feel blocked and stressed. Stress creates blocking and uh, um, eliminates any kind of uh, creative, uh, positive thinking, brings the, 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 the worst competitive side that we all have um, and uh, creates this toxic environment that everybody, even if they are highly paid or and enjoy status, they actually are not happy being there, and I have, and, and I know many cases like that. Uh, and of course, during my course, I also have uh, had uh, uh, the luck, I will say, to uh, cooperate with many kind of uh, leadership models, uh, and many kind of models that there was no model; it was just a chaos there. <laughs> And uh, this is also interesting because there it is uh, like this uh, reality so shows survivor that uh, one uh, is uh, able to place himself, herself, where uh, no, he, he or she knows that she can be accepted from that particular mix of people that is there at that uh, space and time to talk a little about physics. So this uh, electromagnetic field is very important. And uh, as you said, because you were exposed in a positive uh, leadership, you also got to uh, express the positive and, and, uh, and uh, to be aware of the positive signs that you even didn't know that you had. Uh, so it is like this, action and reaction. We need to, uh, to, to move fast. Whenever we see that it's not uh, uh, having any impact in our growth, we need to move fast and keep our radars open. So having said that, uh, 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 to repeat again, that uh, according to the model that you follow, it is uh, in connection to the frequency that I said, which is the most efficient uh, recipe. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anastasia, for your uh, views on that. Uh, and I would agree with what you just said, that it's important to create that kind of a culture and an environment where people can thrive. And we can proudly say that at GIBS, we have that kind of a Yeah, I'm sorry about that. So at GIBS, we have that culture wherein we respect individuals and we value individuals and we have constant appreciation for each other for the value that they bring to the institution, the value that they bring to the classroom and to the various things that they constantly do. And this brings me to the last question for uh, Professor Bharat here. So uh, as a GIBS IRE uh, faculty uh, uh, that, uh, who's there instructing the students and bringing those uh, IRE values to the class, what kind of values do you think we can derive from the humanistic perspective and what is it that you could add further to what we are already doing at the IRE uh, workshops that we do for our students? Yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, while it is very important as leaders, as management, that we follow the humanistic principles, it is also very important that we help students imbibe these values of dignity, respect for each other, empathy with people. And I have seen quite a few colleges having this program on innovation and entrepreneurship as courses. But we have interspersed the, between the two, innovation and entrepreneurship, the research part. Research part is, I can have great ideas and can go, and go about implementing it, but research part brings out that empathy. Am I connected with the stakeholders? Am I connected with my customers? Am I connected with different people who are going to be impacted by my innovation or the new idea that I bring in? This research makes it more grounded so that the people who want to create that business have the connect with different stakeholders and the uh, society on which they'll be making an impact. That makes it, I think, more responsible. I, as a leader or facilitator of IRE, I think that I would reiterate or reinforce that thought that research should bring in responsibility on the part of all of us to bring in something that not just uh, in the uh, pursuit of making money or business, but more with the intention of helping the society at large. I think this uh, summit 
uh, reinforces that point. I'm thank you, thanks, I'm my thanks to all of you for bringing that, bringing forth that point. And I also would say that there were quite a few ideas which are about uh, socio entrepreneurship. There are students who are working on bamboo oven clots. There are students who are working on plowing back corporate CSR into schools, rural schools, so that they get a better education. There are students who are working on uh, smart street lights so that energy conservation is there. So there are quite a few projects, but all the projects that we work on should lead to some positive impact on the society. I think at a larger level, it is about empathy and creating a, a larger good to the society. That should be the goal of all of us at IRE here. Thanks for sharing interesting thoughts, and I think this will take us forward in working on our uh, ideas, business ideas, and maturing them to real businesses. Though our idea of IRE is not necessarily making them all start business, instilling a strong sense of entrepreneurial mindset, which, through which they can imbibe all these values of humanness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bharat. So with this, we come to an end to the panel discussion, and I'll quickly summarize a few learnings that we'd had through the panel discussion. So the panel discussion basically centered around human at the center of whatever we do. So even though we might hear a lot of talk about technology, a lot of talk about so much of innovation happening, but then human is at the center of all of it. We also discussed the importance of ethics. So whatever we do, it's important that we do ethically. We understand the organization's value system. We understand why the organization exists and stick to those values even though we strive to achieve profits and to grow financially as well. So it's important that we keep ethics at the heart of our value system. And we also talk about frequency. So when we say there is a good habit, there is a good value system that we practice, it's important that we frequently practice that so that it becomes habit. And I think we also talk about that 21 days rule wherein we keep practicing something for 21 days continuously and if we do that, that becomes a habit for sure. So I think that is something which we need to practice every day in the manner in which we conduct ourselves. Pictures. <laughs> Sure. Get it wider. Wider. <laughs>